my name is John Carlyle. This is tutorial 1.5, the fifth in a sequence on proactive cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And we're looking at normal values. I hope the graphs on the screen look somewhat familiar to you. Um, they're the two graphs that we use primarily to identify the anaerobic threshold. The top graph is a plot on the vertical axis of carbon dioxide output. And on the horizontal axis for both of these graphs is oxygen consumption. On the upper graph in turquoise are the sequential plots of values for carbon dioxide output against oxygen consumption. And the anaerobic threshold, if you recall, is identified by bringing in, bringing in a unitary tangent and wherever that bop, 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 touches the um, data points, the last dot in contact, that's the value we assign to the anaerobic threshold. So we draw down a vertical line from that last dot in contact. That's our anaerobic threshold. And that should be coincident with the nadir in these values in the lower graph in red, which were excuse me, just sneeze, which were the ventilator equivalents for carbon dioxide, which were defined as minute ventilation divided by oxygen consumption in red. And the equivalent values in blue are for carbon dioxide output. So we're plotting these two ratios, that one and this one, against on the horizontal axis, uh, oxygen consumption. And if you recall, both these ventilator equivalents fall during exercise because as time progresses, we take deeper breaths and the gas exchange becomes more efficient. More of each breath uh, participates in gas exchange and a smaller proportion is dead space. Uh, after the anaerobic threshold, which is this point here, we hyperventilate in, in relation to oxygen, oxygen consumption and the ventilator equivalents for oxygen consumption climb. Whereas those for carbon dioxide are either on, in a plateau, it's going horizontally, or are still declining at the anaerobic threshold. And the value for ventilator equivalents at the anaerobic threshold, although not the lowest value for the ventilator equivalents for carbon dioxide. Those have a particular prognostic value, which I'll show you on another graph in a moment. The nadir for the ventilator equivalents for carbon dioxide also have a name. So this nadir is called the respiratory compensation point. Whereas if you recall the nadir in the graph of oxygen ventilator equivalents is the anaerobic threshold. So what I'd like to do on the next graph is plot minute ventilation on the vertical axis with on the horizontal axis, we will plot carbon dioxide output. So we're basically going to draw a graph of this ratio. So let's delete what is on the screen in front of you. and draw that graph. I'm going to draw it freehand, so no, I'm not, if I don't press the right button. Here we have minute ventilation. And on the horizontal axis, we're going to have ventilator equivalents for, so not ventilator equivalents, for, we're going to have carbon dioxide output. There we go. And we're going to be breathing uh, less at the beginning of the bicycle ride and we're going to be bringing, breathing more at the end. So this is going to be the end and this is going to be the start. And similarly, at the beginning of the bicycle ride, we're going to be breathing out less carbon dioxide. And at the end, we're going to be breathing out more carbon dioxide. So the dots, as you would imagine, go from left bottom left to top right in some sort of way. Now the bulk of the plotted values follow a, fall on a straight line, they're linear. 
And this gradient, and the gradient is this divided by this, the value of that gradient is pretty similar to the value of ventilator equivalence of carbon dioxide at the anaerobic, anaerobic threshold. So just to do in miniature that graph I showed you just earlier, anaerobic threshold here, the nadir of ventilator equivalence for oxygen. Ventilator equivalence for oxygen. So the nadir for ventilator equivalence for oxygen, at that point, the value of the ventilator equivalence for carbon dioxide are pretty similar to this overall gradient. And it will have a value normally somewhere between 20 if you're young to a maybe mid 30s if you're 90 years old or so. At the beginning, the gradient might be a little bit steeper because breathing is less efficient. So just for the first few minutes when you're not breathing deeply. So this area here may or should show you a slightly steeper gradient on this plot. And after the respiratory compensation point, again, this, the values get steeper. So this is the respiratory compensation point. So this is a normal looking plot for minute ventilation against carbon dioxide output. So this is ventilator equivalence during a bicycle ride for carbon dioxide. Okay, now to finish off normal values, we're going to talk about what are called the oxygen pulse. And the oxygen pulse, we need to know two things. We need to know the oxygen consumption, and we need to know the heart rate. And we've already drawn what happens during exercise test, period of rest, three minutes of free will, and about 10 minutes of incremental test. And we know that in normal circumstances, the resting value for oxygen, start free wheeling at about approximately doubles, get into the incremental phase, slight delay, and then the values go up linearly until the end. So that's our normal pattern of oxygen consumption during a incremental preoperative cardiopulmonary exercise test. Uh, what does the heart rate do? Fairly similar, fairly flat, will be going up, usually not in a single gradient, will reach a peak. The peak value, the peak value up here at the end, is approximately 220 minus the range. Obviously beta blockers and so on will change that, but that's uh, a normal uh, peak value. The oxygen pulse is another ratio value and it equals the oxygen consumption divided by the heart rate at that point. So at any point along here we can use the oxygen consumption value and the heart rate value divide this oxygen consumption by heart rate and it will give us a value. So what does that plot look like normally? Well, Let's draw a graph. So we've got time, 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 along the horizontal line, horizontal axis. And we're going to have this ratio of oxygen consumption divided by heart rate or the oxygen pulse. And um, It increases during a bicycle ride, but it follows a hyperbolic plot. Now that ra fairly rapidly approaches horizontal. Horizontal, or very similar to horizontal, is normal. 
but it should be preceded by a steady increase in the curving value. The peak value achieved again varies with age and it falls with age. So it might be, I don't know, 15, 17 when you're young and fall down to 7 as you get older because although your predicted peak heart rate falls as you get older, so this ratio would increase, your peak oxygen consumption falls even quicker. So the achieved peak value of this ratio falls as you get older. So this oxygen pulse, what's the unit of measurement? Well, oxygen consumption, that is mils of oxygen per minute. And heart rate is beats per minute, isn't it? So it's number per minute or per minute. So per minute cancels out. And we end up with mils of oxygen. So the unit of measurement of the oxygen pulse is mils of oxygen or milliliters of oxygen. And what it's saying is per heartbeat, each time your heart beats, ba boom, how much oxygen is taken out of your blood? So that's going to depend on two things. It's going to depend upon in the tissues, what is the oxygen extraction ratio? What is the proportion of oxygen in your bloodstream that is extracted? And it's going to depend upon your stroke volume. So how big is each heartbeat? So uh, proportion of blood, how much oxygen is taken out of the blood? How much of the blood is there? That's the stroke volume. So it depends upon two values. Sometimes people will incorrectly interpret the oxygen pulse as solely representing heart function, stroke volume, but it doesn't. It also represents tissue function, so oxygen extraction in the tissues. I think I probably want to call it a day, except to finish off with what I've alluded to previously, which is the pattern of breathing during exercise. So if we plot vertically minute ventilation, sorry, cancel that. That's not what I want because on that axis. Try again, John. On the vertical axis, if we plot tidal volume, and on the horizontal axis, axis we're going to plot a minute ventilation. There is a peak value to minute ventilation. Um, you can uh, estimate it. Having measured the FEV1, you can multiply that by 40, and it will give you a maximum value, an envelope value, or you can directly measure it, and that's what we do. We measure max, maximum voluntary ventilation during 12 seconds, multiply by that by five for 60 seconds, and that gives us the peak expected minute ventilation. So we've got a, an envelope on the right. The vertical envelope is represented by the inspiratory capacity, which we also measure before the bicycle ride. What you'd expect to see if you plot tidal volume, so tidal volume is going to start low at the beginning and go upwards. Minute ventilation is going to start low at the beginning and go upwards. So we're going to have dots going from the bottom left up towards the top right. And usually you'd expect something like this to happen. The person finishes the bicycle rides usually before they get within 15% of their measured maximum voluntary ventilation. So there is a um, potential further, the, the potential for more exercise as far as the lungs are concerned, but you just run out of basically heart function before you get there. So this gap here should be at least 15% under normal circumstances. There are a couple of um, exceptions. So obviously people who have lung disease uh, will uh, may well encroach upon their maximum voluntary ventilation. But also um, sort of Olympic level athletes may have um, trained their heart so well 
that the heart is capable of reaching the peak exercise that is limited by their uh, lungs. So this is the end of tutorial 1.5. I've described in this and the preceding four tutorials the normal responses to exercise. In tutorial 1.6, we're going to start thinking about how to go through uh, a preoperative exercise test to identify whether it is normal or abnormal. And we therefore are going to have to look at how the normal test is laid out. And in tutorial 1.6, I will be discussing with you what is called the nine panel plot. No prizes for guessing why it is called the nine panel plot because there are nine panels in this plot. Okay, look forward to talking to you in tutorial 1.6 about the nine panel plot. See you then.